the spectrum is supposed to work. Um, start at the top and work your way down. So I can't do nothing. Vegetation is not going to work. You should be trying to do the least uh, impactful thing. Another thing you do is regrade. So one of the things, if you have a really steep bank, um, and you can see uh, there's an overhang, the roots are going off the edge, this is going to continue to erode. If waves hit the toe, it's not stabilizing, it's going to keep caving in. Here you can see it just keeps slumping down over time. Uh, one of the things is you need to stabilize the toe. If you can't stabilize the toe where it is, you might be able to cut it back. So you're losing some of your upland, but hopefully you're going to be able to vegetate that bank and slow down the erosion rate. Um, that's talking about regrading the face of the coastal bank. On the upland side, you have to worry about runoff. If you have a lot of rain pooling, you don't have dry wells and things like that, you may be having runoff going over the top or you may be having runoff going down into like your lawn, hitting a particular layer like a clay that's going to flow across and then come out on the face of the coastal bank. This stuff looks like dribble castles that you make on the beach, but obviously it's going to erode much more quickly with these uh, kind of canyons in there than it would if it was a stable bank. Manage to retreat. Uh, there's a couple different ways to move. You can go up. So you can lift the house, you can jack it up. Um, this is mainly for flooding. So if your house, if the uh, coastal bank is eroding, simply jacking it up isn't going to help. Uh, this is a way to get up out of the flood zone. There's huge insurance impacts for that. Uh, the deeper you are in the flood water, the more expensive. If you can raise yourself up out of there, you're going to get insurance cuts. Uh, the other is horizontal migration. Up here, uh, very rapid erosion. Actually, this is the island of Chappaquiddick. Um, when the barrier beach eroded out there uh, due to a variety of uh, inlet changes, the erosion really beefed up. You were losing over 100 feet a year for a while. Uh, they put some structures out there that I'll talk about in a bit, but mostly they were just buying time to move the house. Most of the time, they'll jack the house up and roll it. This particular house, uh, they dug down a pit between the house and the new foundation and just rolled it in place. That was to preserve the bowling alley in the basement. <laughs> and actually, I think just yesterday or maybe the day before, but back in April, the barrier beach has reconnected. Everyone's breathing a sigh of relief. A day or two ago, they got a new breach in it. Uh -huh. So that's just kind of how things happen over time that um, it hasn't really formed a robust barrier beach system. It's still in that kind of transition phase. It may seal up very quickly or it may cause a new inlet to migrate. We'll see. Uh, beach nourishment is another thing on the spectrum. And as we move down the spectrum, we're kind of going towards uh, things that have more potential for impact. There's a couple different kinds or, or methods of doing beach nourishment. One is doing it from upland. So you're going to a sand pit somewhere, you're digging it out, putting it on a truck, backing it up, dumping it. The other is offshore. It's very difficult to do offshore sand mining uh, unless you have an existing navigation project. It's very difficult to get the permits, do an improvement dredging. Um, with that in mind, if you have a navigation project, it's very important to put it back on the beach as opposed to taking it offshore. Um, we can certainly talk about what's going on in Sandwich for quite a while, but we won't. <laughs> um, here we are on Town Beach in Sandwich. This is a particular um, method of trying to preserve with beach nourishment, the sacrificial dune. They just pretty much uh, put dump truck piles here. And the idea was it would erode the front of it and move down the beach. Uh, unfortunately, uh, last winter it worked around it. And as soon as you have any breach in that system, all this is just highly mobilized sand. It blew through and formed a huge overwash, plugged up uh, Mill Creek for a while. On the plus side, they were able to dig that out, rebuild the dune that they didn't have permits to do before. Um, when you're doing beach nourishment, it's not all about sand. You've got to match what's down there. If you put sand over top of cobbles, it's going to go away very quickly, uh, mostly as the higher energy. As you increase energy, you can move bigger things. So if you have a certain energy level, there's a reason why it's only cobbles there, uh, especially with some of the small-scale nourishments that we do here. Very uh, small as opposed to like doing New Jersey coastline for miles and miles. Here's a couple local spots in Mashpee here, South Cape Beach. Uh, this is right before Hurricane Sandy, uh, Papanessa Beach up in the upper right corner. Here we are right afterwards. You see a sacrificial pile of sand was put on the edge of this parking lot. 
Uh, it may have prevented some damage, but there was still five to ten feet of parking lot loss. Uh, up here there was fencing, dune grass, and now there's just huge uh, overwash fans blown through the beach, uh, close into that navigation channel. Uh, what did they do? It's a navigation channel, so they're allowed to dredge it. They dredge it very quickly, put it back up on the beach. Uh, these property owners are very aware that having a barrier beach in front of them uh, is much more beneficial for their upland property than having exposed coastline. So they uh, highly subsidize a lot of the restoration efforts out here on the beach. Uh, over on South Cape Beach, what they did is this is uh, actually one of the stronger things, and I'll show kind of where it is on the spectrum, but uh, they created an uh, artificial dune, but within that dune they have a core envelope and they have pilings as anchors, and I'll talk about core envelopes in just a minute. Uh, but moving on to sand fencing, sand fencing is usually these... Uh, the slats here. Um, it can be a variety of things though. Whatever you do, don't use the metal. I go out after storms and constantly see these rusty metal spikes coming up from those things. Uh, definitely use wood if at all possible. The idea of the sand fencing is just to slow down the wind. As uh, wind blows, you can feel the like sand hitting your legs on a strong day. As it slows down, it can't carry as much wind. The fence slows down that wind, drops the sand forms a dune. Hopefully you can do some fence uh, uh, planting afterwards to build that up. There's a huge variety of sand fencing. This is called drift fence where you have 12 inch piles and 2 by 3s uh, Definitely more substantial. Uh, this kind of ice can actually even break up that. That's why just a few days ago I saw 4 by 4s instead of 2 by 3s So <laughs> you keep working your way towards something. They even come in pretty colors. <laughs> Uh, this is the, definitely the, the far extreme of what anybody even tried to call fence. This is 12 inch pilings and inch spacing between them. So we call that a pile wall as opposed to the uh, fencing that was on the site plan. Um, I don't think I put the video in here, but even this, during uh, uh, Sandy, they were out there constantly pouring sand over the side of it. So even though they had the pile wall, they had some rocks in front, they had these envelopes, uh, it's still eroding very quickly. It's not completely stopping the system. So it's still getting in the system. Uh, let's see, we're into fiber rolls, so and I'm going a little bit quicker. This is shredded up coconut husk with some core netting around it. Uh, a couple different ways to do it. Kind of the basic uh, original intention of it was kind of an estuarine and riverine systems to kind of build up a little stability within there. You can stake it down with wooden stakes. Uh, what it's come to now, uh, trying to be a much more intense uh, stabilization technique where they use a high density fiber roll they stack them eight high and they regrade everything and the idea behind this is you have to keep it covered if it is uncovered it can be exposed to wind and sun it degrades very quickly in the UV uh, the original idea behind it is it's intended to degrade it's supposed to biodegrade eventually the plant root system will be able to take over by the time this goes away a lot of the times uh, it gets wiped out by a storm and put back in place before the roots can take off. So it's a, a tough call of whether they're being effective and it's very site specific. Uh, some of them get wrapped in metal, uh, kind of beat themselves up inside until they go away. Uh, some of them, if you put them below the uh, mean high water line, they go away very quickly. Uh, and if you don't stake them down properly, uh, any kind of wiggle gets horribly exacerbated during a storm and it just uh, gets ripped out. Even this kind of structure can have terminal scour on the end, just some wave refraction around the edge being able to claw away at the uh, corner of the structure. Uh, and they float. They float and they move on the waves and they can be uh, navigation hazards. Uh, moving up a step, these are core envelopes, obviously much bigger. Uh, they call them sand sausages, sand burritos. Uh, here's a scale, somebody putting one in uh, where they'll form a, a box but much, much larger, um, can handle a lot more than the uh, fiber rolls can. Uh, some people use sand tacos, that they lay them down flat like this, put them with sand and then fold them back over the top. And here's one who uh, did the wrong thing, the town will remain nameless, but uh, they have a nice layer of burlap, which will biodegrade over time, and uh, a nice layer of core on the outside, which is going to biodegrade and allow plants to get through. And then a nice plastic geotextile right in the middle. So 
It's, uh, it's not going away anytime soon in there. The theory behind the burlap is that it's supposed to last uh, a period of uh, months to a year, so it's not going to allow the sand to go out as quickly while it's still fluffy. Uh, the geotextile is, is a lot more like a sandbag. And this is kind of where we're getting into what is and isn't a CES. So if you wrap something in plastic like that, that's when it starts to become a CES. Uh, coastal engineering structure is when it comes into the Wetland Protection Act. Uh, basically, it's when it starts to alter wave, tidal, or sediment transport, when it's affecting things going perpendicular or parallel to the beach. Uh, now we're moving into these CESs. Uh, two of the shore perpendicular methods, one of the, which is a groin. Uh, so when you get uh, uh, longshore transport along the beach, and you find this coastal structure like groinia deposition on one side, you get erosion or uh, uh, just uh, deprivation of sediment on the other side, so you get an erosion. Uh, you can see here's kind of the classic uh, build up on the updrift, uh, much lower on the other side. Some of the times they talk about notching these groins, so they'll pull out a few rocks at a certain elevation to allow sand to bypass on that side. The next level is a jetty. So the groin is supposed to allow sand to go past it. The jetty is intended not to allow sand to go past it. Uh, with this, again, there's winners and losers. If you don't allow sand past here, these guys are going to lose out. Uh, also, there's some areas where the jetty is already at capacity. So uh, if any more sand comes in here, it just goes over the top or around into the delta or works its way into the pond. So uh, sediment bypassing is supposed to be a part of jetties. If you were going to propose a new jetty, you would have to propose sediment bypassing. Um, the interesting thing is for all existing jetties, there's almost no sediment bypassing and it's a heck of a permanent structure to be even able to allow sediment bypassing. Uh, moving into shore parallel protection now. So now we're not affecting longshore transport, we're affecting cross shore, the actual shoreline change or erosion. Uh, sandbags, these geotextiles, uh, they do not degrade uh, either through biological processes, maybe a little bit by sun, but not often. Uh, and after a few months, if you go up there, uh, give them a kick, it's like kicking cement. Um, just as much as a rock, uh, potentially when they tear, they put plastic and uh, marine debris into the uh, environment. These are called gabions, uh, a wire mesh basket, usually in estuarine systems. The uh, coated wire mesh seems to last a little bit better. Uh, one of the problems is they usually stack them very steep with these smaller ones. Some of the marine mattresses might be able to get a better slope, but uh, the idea is these rocks move a little bit and they allow groundwater and, and water to pass through. So it's not having as big an effect as a full seawall bulkhead or abutment. Uh, this is a breakwater. Here we are up in Provincetown. Uh, you can see the effect of this breakwater and these smaller breakwaters. It builds uh, sediment behind it, but it builds... Uh, the difference between a breakwater and a sill is the breakwater is always exposed. You can always see it. A sill is a lower elevation structure, so usually at high tides it's going to be underwater. It's just meant to trip waves as they come in as opposed to completely stop them. Uh, revetments, these are kind of the classic Cape Cod look now. Uh, very large boulders. Uh, here we're on surf drive. The problem is uh, you get a lot of wave reflection on these. So as you get wave reflection, you create turbulence at the toe of the revetment, which can move a lot of sand around and take it offshore. So typically, uh, shoreline change may get exacerbated during these, and you start losing your beach at uh, some of the higher tides. And when you do that, you get more action on the rocks, and it just kind of speeds up the whole system. Uh, here's a spot in the town of Dennis where you have 1.3 solid miles of revetment, all on private properties. It's, it's all single lots, but they all kind of work together to get a, a very long structure. Uh, right here is one of the very popular beaches in Dennis. Um, it's really interesting that the shoreline is much further back, but they have a beach. This shoreline is much further out, but at high tide they have no beach whatsoever. Seawalls, these are the straight up vertical. They can be uh, uh, typically concrete, but you get a lot of reflective wave energy, a lot of uh, um, erosion, and obviously it's not going to move. It's not going to react as either the tide comes up, the storm comes up, or sea level rises. It can't um, migrate as a natural system would. 
bulkheads. Uh, these are typically wood, typically riverine, estuarine. A lot of reflective energy. You can see that the beach tends to drop over time. You can see the stain change. And a lot of returns. If you don't do a proper return, you can get terminal scour and scour where the uh, waves are able to reach up around the corner there and uh, create a lot of erosion for your neighbor. It's best to <laughs> keep these structures at least a, a few tens of feet away from the edge of your property line. So if you do have this kind of terminal erosion, it's on your property as opposed to your neighbor. Uh, how this spectrum is supposed to work, um, start at the top and work your way down. So I can't do nothing. Vegetation is not going to work. So you just keep working your way down until you find something that you think might work. And at that point, don't go any further. <laughs> you can do this and do some of these other things too. But the theory is uh, don't start down here and somebody tells you you can't do that and then you work your way back up. You should be trying to do the least uh, impactful thing that will actually preserve your property. Um, obviously, it's not going to be a complete list. That thing's only one fold out. Um, and there's things being invented and modified all the time. Some of these fiber rolls are becoming harder with this wire mesh. Um, these uh, uh, core envelopes become very hard with that geotextile. Some of these gabions are becoming less hard. They're putting that core batting inside it. So it's not just rock. It's some bio uh, uh, material in there as well. And some of the things with these revetments and things like that, if your neighbors do them and you don't, you can get a lot of terminal scour within here. So you can see, just trying to preserve that line gets harder and harder over time. Uh, very few projects only employ one method. So when you're looking at this kind of idea, go with the hardest within there. So they're doing vegetation, sand fencing. Everything is not a CES, so, but you should be judging it kind of as the sand fencing. Here's some uh, fiber rolls and vegetation. Here's a revetment and seawall. So they're both CSs, obviously. But you can get in kind of this gray area where you're, oh, we're using fiber rolls and nourishment. Yeah, but we're also using gabions in there, too. So it's, it's a, a game at times. And the idea is you're trying to increase your resilience of your upland, but you're not trying to uh, decrease the effectiveness of your natural resources in the area. And with that, we can do questions. As a GIS director at the Cape Cod Commission, my job is to visualize science. I am not a scientist. Um, so a lot of the questions that I might get, I might just defer them to you too, um, because I don't, uh, I don't necessarily know all the answers. But uh, why I want to show you the sea level rise application and why Joan asked me to speak to you all tonight is that basically with climate change and sea level rise or storm surge, we're all talking about the same thing, which is rising water. And water is gonna tend to rise in the same place in the same direction. So what I'm doing is using the sea level rise application as a proxy for where water may travel during a storm. So um, what we did um, was take a sea level rise model put out by NOAA and modified it slightly um, to be a little bit more um, uh, accurate for local conditions because the NOAA model was based on like, 50 meter elevations and so we took it down to 2 meter elevations so that you could have a little bit better accuracy but same model, same science, uh, different numbers. and. Uh, when you're in any browser, you can take sea level rise on this little um, dot here that shows zero and pump it up and it'll show the water rising here on the Cape. You can enter your address. So you can type in your address and zoom in. The cool thing that it shows is not only the sea level rise, which is the blue stuff is where the water's gonna go at two feet. Um, what we did was took a look at what effect that was gonna have on existing infrastructure. So in this case, at two foot sea level rise, these little red dots here are showing where theoretically the water is going to overtake a road. 
Um, and so, um, in this case, of course, it's not going to be all that accurate because that's a there's a bridge there, um, and the bridge isn't accounted for. But what this could do for you in planning your, um, you know, planning in the wake of a storm is looking at where your house is compared to where your local shelter is. And so you can see where in some neighborhoods, like up in Bourne, um, there might be a case where the road that you normally take to get to from point A to point B might um, have a higher likelihood of being overwashed by storm surge. And so you might want to take an alternative route. Um, the other bit that we have on here is uh, critical facilities. So we worked with the Barnstable County Emergency Preparedness um, Agency, uh, Cape Cod Commission being a um, member of the Barnstable County government, and uh, compiled a number of critical facilities that are all shown in one color, but you can filter those out. So different, you know, agriculture would be like um, uh, fisheries, like um, oyster farm, or uh, commercial retail emergency response would be uh, fire department, uh, police department. And so you can turn on and off these different things so that you have you know, depending on what it is that you're looking for. So maybe you want to turn off all of them except for your emergency shelters. And these, um, these critical facilities also um, will turn red if they're affected by that sea level rise or rising water. So you can see one down here is probably a marina um, and then that whole neighborhood at three foot sea level rise is basically inaccessible. Um, so this, I mainly wanted to show you this as a, a way for you to look at your neighborhood in terms of how you might get from point A to point B in the, you know, before an emergency, as Greg was saying, you don't want to do this sort of thing on your smartphone when everybody and his brother is trying to call their loved ones. Um, but in advance, look at, you know, planning your route from, you know, where you are to a family member's house, where you are to an emergency shelter, or um, uh, to the local fire department. Uh, so that's just one tool that uh, you can use uh, in conjunction with a bunch of other tools. In addition to having the sea level rise on there, we also have the general slosh categories which don't um, do the same uh, functionality of cutting off the roads. Um, that's something that we don't have the resources to do right now, but in the future we hope to show that disconnected network in the event of uh, the different categories of um, hurricanes. Uh, this application is available on our website, keepcloudcommission.org. Emergency Response Team Coordinator for the Town of Falmouth. I'm actually part of the Constable County CERT team and it's all about people helping people. We're a volunteer organization where everybody who's involved is actually trained through the Bonsville County Sheriff's Office and any of you and all of you can join and I would encourage you to do that because it's all about the numbers. What we focus on is trying to make people personally prepared for any one of these events. We've heard a lot about hurricanes tonight. When's the hurricane coming around yet? June 1st through? November 30th. So it's not over yet. Our Easter's is another big thing that comes up. Besides being able to uh, train yourself to be better protected and protect your family and protect your neighborhood, if you have any time left over after that, then you come up and help us at the shelter. Sure, it also runs the shelters. Anybody know where the shelter is in Falmouth? The high school. The high school. The high school. The high school. Excellent. The Falmouth High School Shelter is both a local shelter and one of the six regional shelters in Bonsville County. And when we go regional, we get the help of the Red Cross and the MRC and all kinds of things, but it still comes down to us as people. 
So if any of you are interested in joining the CERT team, it's open to anybody 18 years of age or older, even less than 18 years of age if you come with a you know, legal guardian. Usually it's the young guys and gals that help us to really get together. Yes, sir. Is the Family Shelter open to pets? It is indeed. We are a pet-friendly shelter. Our last uh, major storm of Nemo, we had 304 humans, 23 dogs, and 15 cats. <laughs> Which, by the way, is a very interesting thing. We encourage people to come to the shelter before they actually need to, because the roads are flooded and things like that. We want you to be able to work to prepare yourself and prepare a kit, you know, at your home so that you have the necessary materials to supply uh, yourself for at least three days, either whether you shelter in place or you bring it with you. And the pet component is a very important one because, you know, nobody wants to leave Fluffy behind and we'd love to have Fluffy come with you. So yes, you can you can bring your animals. I yes, have a question about homeless people and our winter, upcoming winter weather. Uh -huh. Our winter is as hard this year as it was last year. Is there some comparable entity in Falmouth that finds a place to shelter homeless people from the cold for the <coughs> There are different warming centers. The shelter itself is actually activated either by the emergency planners within the town of Falmouth or regionally if it becomes a regional shelter. Of course, everybody's welcome, you know, for something like that. But uh, around here in Falmouth, other than some of the churches and other things, there is no specific homeless shelter in, in the town of Falmouth, but there are places in Hyannis and other places. So, but, uh, it's being worked on. It, it is being worked on, You're absolutely right. In fact, that we have a very strong uh, faith-based community that supports a lot of these things and uh, what I'm really here to tell you about is a couple of things. If I leave you with any thought that I don't want to take too much of your time. And one is I want you to be personally prepared. I want you to look into what it takes to be prepared to shelter for yourself and take care of your family. More importantly, I want you to know where the shelter is and what, be, what you can do if in fact you need to move out. I do a whole presentation, I do a lot of outreach uh, speaking for various groups. And the hardest thing to do is to get you guys all, including myself, to, to move when you have to. And a lot of times, 911 is not, a lot, not enough. And what I mean by that, and everybody knows, I, I've done a lot of research that when a real event occurs, the first responders are actually pretty occupied and doing a lot of things. So while you're able to, uh, you know, I'm not telling you have to leave your home, but I want you to be prepared. You heard a, a lot about making uh, your home resilient. Uh, to certain situations, well, I'm more focused on making people resilient to the situations and knowing how to uh, survive and knowing when to ask for help. I'd also encourage you to go on uh, the website and look at the Bonsville County Sheriff's Office and see if you're interested in the CERT organization, you can actually sign up. Uh, the training classes are usually six weeks long, one night a week. When you get done, you get all of that stuff that's in that little go bag out there that helps you to be better prepared for your family and your neighborhood and the town. And um, those classes are, uh, can occur, but we, the last one was in found, I think there's one more now.